Hello and welcome to the Westvale Archives. I'm Jenna, I am an author illustrator from Newfoundland, Canada, and this is my booktube slash authortube platform. You may also know me from my art channel, Jenna Gets Creative. The channel actually hit 1k this summer, and once I get the watch hours that's also required to apply for the YouTube Partner Program, I'm holding a big art supply giveaway over there, so if you're into art and you might be interested in that giveaway, go ahead and subscribe now so you don't miss it, and maybe watch a few videos while you're there. Today I'd like to gush about some of the great books that have released in the first half of September. First of all, to kick it off, a book that is on my TBR, I pre-ordered the ebook, I have it now, have not read it yet, but I do have some wonderful character art cards and a signed book plate, even though it's an ebook and I don't have a book to put it in. <laughs> Aiden Thomas's Cemetery Boys. This book released on September 1st. It is a trans teen coming of age Latinx story. I've heard debate about whether or not you're actually supposed to verbally pronounce Latinx or if you're supposed to go Latino, Latina. I don't know. <laughs> it's not my community. Let me know if it is your community, how I'm supposed to verbalize that in a video. <laughs> Aiden Thomas actually made history because their book is on the New York Times bestseller list for YA fantasy and it's a trans character written by a trans author and it's Latino. Like, amazing. I can't wait to read it. I wanted to read the ARC, I applied for it. Actually, I wished for it because it's not open for requests for Canadians. I also tried to get the ARC for their next book, Lost in the Neverwoods. Again, wished for it. I don't think the publisher who's working with that on NetGalley has rights outside of literally just the USA because I'm Canadian and normally I can request those books but for me it's just wish for it which means they're they're not accepting Canadians sadly so yeah pre-ordered the ebook it's waiting for me to get caught up with my arcs and my book tour books seriously congratulations Aiden on your awesome book hitting the New York Times bestseller list can't wait to read it and gush about it more, I'll probably do a full video when I have a review. The next shout out goes to Susanna Clark. This is not her new book. This book's from the early 2000s. This is Jonathan Strange and Mr. Norrell. I started reading it back in high school and I lost it. <laughs> Massive book. I was probably not even halfway through. Lost it. Never got another copy and picked it up again. And then Murphy Napier picked it up and gushed about it. And I went out and found a copy on the Bargain Books shelf, so here it is, haven't read it yet. Uh, I'm holding this book for two reasons. One, I am going to do some editing magic on the thumbnail and turn this into To Sleep in the Sea of Stars. But also, Susanna Clark had a new book come out on September 15th, and that is Piranesi. It's an alternate universe, alternate reality type story, which sounds really fascinating. I didn't hear about it in time to try to request it on NetGalley. They closed requests quite early on that one. And unlike this massive beast, that one's not even 300 pages. Should be a much quicker read. And I will definitely be checking that one out eventually. Moving in to the books that I did actually get to read ahead of time, the ARC reviews. I am going to give reviews. I try not to give spoilers in my reviews. But I will have timestamps down below just in case you want to skip over one of them. Of course, the big ones that are in the title will be coming last because I want you to stick around. Next up, I want to talk about The Forgotten Kingdom by Signe Pike. I, I know Signe Pike is famous for some other fantasy books. She's been on the shelves for quite a few years. I remember seeing her stuff in the bookstores when I was in high school. And not an author I was really obsessed with, so not a name that jumped out at me when I saw it available for request on NetGalley. I actually got an email, this might appeal to you, <laughs> from somebody at NetGalley. It was advertised as Outlander meets Arthurian legend, which made me really interested because my mom is obsessed with Outlander. She's read the book, she's watched the series, and I know that that one involves a modern day female doctor who is transported back in time. I read The Forgotten Kingdom, there was no time travel. Nobody went back in time. <laughs> so 
so I don't know if that comparison to Outlander confused other people, disappointed other people. It was definitely more a comparison to just the 6th century England, Scotland, Wales setting compared with Arthurian lore, which really is where Arthurian lore should be set anyway, so... <laughs> This is the second book in the Lost Queen trilogy. The first one was the Lost Queen. Sorry right now if I butcher some character name pronunciations. Since I read the advanced reading copy, the page that was supposed to have the pronunciation guide was blank because it wasn't finished yet when they released the ARC. <laughs> so the first book was told from the point of view of Langarat, and it's her coming-of-age story, but also her twin brother's coming-of-age story, Lilacan. This one we get a mixed bag of points of views. We open actually on Lilacan, and then we have Angarat, which is Langarat's daughter, and then we work our way around to Langarat, and then it jumps around, and partway through the story, the point of views get further and further apart in time, the timeline really jumps around which you have to pay attention to. At the beginning of every chapter, it tells you who it is and when it is and where it is, but like, it's a lot to track. <laughs> so the first book was just Langrad and Lilacan coming of age in 6th century United Kingdom continent area. And at some point, I'm sure we got the story of their foster brother who's actual name is Gwendolo, something like that. It reminds me of Wendigo. Gwendolo? Gwendolo? He, at some point, acquired the name and title of Uther Pendragon. This is where the Arthurian lore comes in. This book, The Forgotten Kingdom, they are adults, and of course now Langarad has kids, and Angarad is her youngest. Angarad is eight winters when the book opens, nine winters for a great deal of it, and then her timeline goes way into the future really fast. We see her as a 19 year old then. And uh, she is she is going off with Lilacan to be Lilacan's foster child to study under Lilacan, because Lilacan is a wisdom keeper and Angara shows talent for that. She's going to then go off with him and become a wisdom keeper, but Uther Pendragon and his foster brother, helper, advisor, that's the word I'm looking for, Lilacan, they march off to war against Angara's dad because all of these kingdoms are battling it out, they're fighting. It goes very poorly for the Pendragons, they're wiped out. That's not really a spoiler because that happens so early on in the book. Basically, this book is setting up what we're going to see in the third book, which will be the actual coming of King Arthur, the once and future king, and Lilacan is being set up as his Merlin. This was a very interesting book to read. I definitely enjoyed it. I don't feel like I was lost at all for having not read Langrad's book to begin with. The Lost Queen. I didn't like Langarad's point of view for the first half of the book because we get like Lilacan is such an interesting character and Angarad's point of view seeing this world from a child's perspective was quite cute <laughs> and then we get Langarad and when we meet her she's been drugged and thrown in her chamber so she can't send messengers off to warn her brother and daughter of this battle coming and she's just self-pity monologuing a massive info dump and I just I hated that point of view I hated that chapter I hated her and because of that because I didn't read the first book and I'm not emotionally attached to her I didn't forgive her for like half the book so I'm honestly not sure if all of her chapters in the first half were as bad as I think they were, or if I was just holding a grudge. When Lilacan first brings Angarad to Pendragon Castle, before he goes back off to battle, we get just the littlest hint of her studying with Dyrmid, the 
Wisdom Keeper over Lilacan. We get the littlest hint of this handmaiden being found for her, and it turns out that she, her she's going by one name, but her name's actually Gwen, and she's a noble in hiding, and it's hush hush, it's a secret. At some point she spills all the beans to Lilacan, and we're just told the fact that he now knows all the secrets. We don't know the secrets. We spend the whole book finding out hints of her secrets. But like, I loved the chemistry that was being built between Lilacan and Engrad, between Lilacan and I forget the fake name for Gwen, so I'm just gonna say Gwen. I loved the relationship between Engrad and Dyramid, starting to learn. I wanted more of that. We got literally two or three chapters between Lilacan picking up Engrad at her mother's place, getting to Pendragon Castle, spending like a week with those people, and then going off to battle and the Pendragons are wiped out. I wanted more. I know it's a long book and stuff was probably cut in early drafts for the sake of length, but I don't feel like another chapter or two would have hurt anything. I just really wanted to get to know those characters more. I really felt like as these characters were lost, either because they didn't know where they were or because they were captured or because they were dead, I felt like as they were lost, we were really supposed to care and I didn't because I didn't know them. I do really like where this seems to be going. I am really looking forward to the third book. I will request it to review it. I can't wait for the culmination of this. I will say Langrad's point of view got a lot more interesting about halfway through. I did really like Angrad's experience as she went all over the map and as she we jumped ahead to seeing her as a late teen. And I can't wait to see Lilacan as Merlin. We do get a hint of who's going to be Arthur, and I like that character too. I honestly don't remember at this point what rating I gave it. Somewhere between a 3 and a 4. It was definitely not a 5. <laughs> but it was not bad. If you enjoy Signy Pike's work, if you enjoy Arthurian legend, if you just enjoy historical fantasy, definitely give it a read. I think it was classified as historical fiction, but there's magic involved, so therefore it is historical fantasy. All right, next up, the big book that released on September 15th, and I don't mean the most important title because I do believe the next one I'm going to talk about is more important. I mean the physically biggest book. In print form, it's almost 900 pages. In audiobook, it's 32 hours and change. This is To Sleep in a Sea of Stars by Christopher Paolini. I absolutely gave this one a sincere five stars. Wish I could give it more. If you're thinking, Christopher Paolini. That name sounds familiar. It does, doesn't it? That's because Christopher Paolini wrote The Inheritance Cycle, four books that starred with Aragon, and if you haven't read the books, you probably saw the movie Aragon, or at least heard of it. You've at least heard of people talking about it. I definitely read Aragon. I'm not sure how many of the Inheritance books I read. I know I didn't finish the series, that's the last one was published in 2008. I was 20. I graduated in 2006. I was in the middle of my college stuff. I was busy and also my sister was still a teenager and I was doing this rebellious thing where if it was appropriate for my sister to look for that in the bookstore, I wasn't going to read it because I was an adult. <laughs> Silly, I know. Now I read like half of what I read is YA and I'm 32. So since I didn't finish The Inheritance Cycle, Christopher Paolini is not a name that had come across my reading list since my teenage years, and like I just said, I'm 32. When I started hearing about To Sleep in a Sea of Stars, I did not immediately go, oh, that's the Aragon guy, that's the dragon guy, that's the inheritance guy, that's the guy who got published at 19. Those were not my thoughts. My thoughts were there's some booktubers I like raving about this really epic adult science fiction by this author I've never read sci-fi from. Let's go check it out. Went to NetGalley, saw that the ebook was available for requests, requested it, got denied. Saw that there was a giveaway happening on Goodreads. Didn't win. Haven't won any on Goodreads yet, but I enter. <laughs> and then I saw that there was an audiobook arc 
on NetGalley, applied, got approved. Oh my goodness, guys. Regardless of whether or not you plan to read this book, listen to this book. Not only is this Christopher Paolini, who has quite the experience behind him story writing, the narrator is Jennifer Hale. If that name's not familiar to you, but you are a video game nerd, shame on you. Because <laughs> this is Female Shepherd from the Mass Effect games. And she's narrating an audiobook for a science fiction title, and she's never narrated audiobooks before, but this is her first project at 32 hours and change. Oh my goodness, it is amazing. She is such a good voice actor. There's a cast of over 50 characters and she makes them all distinct. You, like, you can listen to this and never be confused about what character is speaking. She gives them all different voices, all different mannerisms, all different ways of speaking. So this is 23rd century humanity. We've expanded into the universe. Well, at least into the rest of our galaxy, because, you know, it's, it's quite a long way to travel. We do have faster than light speed travel, but you have to go into stasis to do that because, like, even the ship has to go down onto low power and everything. Our main character is Kira Navarez. She is a xenobiologist, and she is engaged to a lovely young man named Alan, and they're thinking of leaving the whole traveling jobs. <laughs> I forget the exact details, but they're always stationed on different ships in different quadrants, going off doing different things, and they see each other in passing every 18 months or so, and they want to stop this, they want to get married, they want to settle down as colonists on Adrastea. They happen to be around Adrastea at this time in the beginning of this book, and Kira goes down to the surface with the landing party doing a few little jobs, and she notices an interesting signature on her infrared or whatever special sight she's got going on with her implants and she's like oh that that's something that needs to be investigated and alan would like a sample of that so she goes over to this rock form falls in realizes this is not a rock form this is a room at some point in the past there was intelligent life on this planet and they built here and she is in a room and then something comes to life in the room and encases her. When she's brought back to the ship, she's completely encased in this black material and everybody's doing experiments on her. They're trying to figure out what this is. Slowly we start to find out that this is some sort of alien exosuit and it's, it's alive, but it's artificial and it's sentient and it's slowly integrating more and more with her. Meanwhile, there are aliens invading human space and we've got a war going on. Most of Kira's crew, all of the ship is destroyed at first contact with these other aliens and she and just a few others manage to escape on escape pods and she's picked up by the crew of a small ship called the Wallfish, which is an old English synonym for a snail, which is interesting. Just gives you a little insight into the mind of the captain of this ship. By far, in a way, the best character in this series is the ship mind of the Wallfish, Grigorovich. Ship minds in this universe are human intelligences, who have been stripped from their human bodies and uploaded into machines and over a course of just a couple of years they expand into these massively knowing evolved transcendent beings usually they are installed into ships and space stations that sort of thing as ship mines and they can take over the ship or they can heed to the captain of the ship which they're supposed to do Grigorovich has a bit of a tragic backstory. He's a, he's a little bit unhinged, but he's fascinated by Kira and the suit. The suit ends up being called the Soft Blade. 
it ends up being able to communicate to Kira some concept images and she interprets that that is what it was called as close as she can equate in English. Back to Jennifer Hale and the narration. <laughs> Not only is she able to give all of these characters fascinating different voices so that it's so clear and such a joy to listen to, as Kira becomes more and more integrated with this suit and more and more a part of this alien species that they're just encountering, her way of speaking changes. And if you listen to the interview at the end of the audiobook, just to sit down between Christopher Paolini and Jennifer Hale, this is something that Jennifer Hale did spontaneously. She decided to change things about the way certain characters spoke, which is so cool that she had that freedom to do that. It's just... The audiobook is such a great collaboration between these two people. Like, seriously, on the 15th, when I tweeted out about my blog post with my review for this one, I congratulated both of them on the release because, really, the audiobook wouldn't be what it is without Jennifer Hale narrating it. I don't know what else I want to say about this one because I don't want this video to be too too long and I don't want to spoil anything. I do have my review blog post linked down below, go check it out. And also go check out other people's reviews. Some people wrote a lot more than I did, some people covered other topics, other points. There's just, there's so much to say about this book. It's 880 pages in print, 32 hours and change in audio. It's a long book, there's a lot to say. There is more coming from this in the future. The, the series, it's known as the Fractalverse. Another blogger actually asked a question in her review and Paolini answered on Goodreads, which is awesome. The question was, is Grigorovich going to make more appearances in future Fractalverse books? And the answer is yes. Just, yes! <laughs> I can't wait for more garbage. <laughs> Alright, on to the next one. Last but not least, perhaps the most important book I'm going to talk about today, also released on September 15th. What was with this day? Happy birthday, by the way, to my best friend, Ify. That was also her birthday. <laughs> most important book on this list, Legendborn by Tracy Dion. I also got to arc read this one through NetGalley, which is amazing. I only heard about this one about three weeks before release date. I thought it was already out from what I was hearing. And then I found it and I'm like, ah, it's probably too late to be approved, but you know, let, let's try request and got approved immediately. Read it in a weekend. Amazing book. So on the surface, this is Arthurian legend. I know I'm reading a lot of Arthurian legend. But on the surface, this is Arthurian legend, modern day, black girl, southern American states, college campus. But it's so much more than that. Our main character is Bree Matthews. She is black. She is bisexual. She's 16. She's entering the early college program at UNC. She and her best friend are actually Alice. Alice is, uh, she's of Asian descent. I want to say Korean, but I'm pretty sure that's wrong. I am sorry. She's not the main character, that wasn't the focus, and she's a lesbian, so there's there's great diversity and representation in this book right off the bat. They're going to this early college program, they've been accepted into this, and they've been warned that if you go off campus after dark, you're gonna get kicked off. Kicked out of the program, kicked off campus, that's it, go home. In the very beginning, right before we're going off to early college with these two, Bree's mom dies in a car accident and she immediately has this change in herself. She calls it before Bree and after Bree, the person she has suddenly become since losing her mother. Which at the beginning just sounds like, you know, grief and loss, that kind of thing. And she's put up this emotional wall to protect the outside world from after Brie and pretend that she is still before Brie. And this is kind of getting her in trouble. It's her idea that they go off campus the first night that they're in the early college program. And while they're there, she starts seeing some interesting things. She sees people that don't seem to expect her to remember them. And she sees some sort of demon creature 
and these people that don't seem to expect her to remember them are dealing with this demon creature. And they seem to be commanding the crowd to go away, disperse, forget you saw this. And the crowd is, but this isn't affecting her. She is staying behind to watch this. And then Alice is concerned because she can't find Bree. She calls the police to help find Bree and they get taken back to campus in the police car. They're pretty sure they're getting expelled in the morning and they haven't even attended a class yet. This is the first part where we really get hit with what kind of racism black girls still face in Southern America and just in the modern world in general because the police officer is talking to them, he's going, yo, my girl tried to get into this program, very prestigious program, she didn't get in. You, Asian one, I'm assuming scholarship kid, and you, black girl, I'm assuming needs base. And when Bree says, no, actually merit, she's considered to have been snarky and rude and had an attitude with the officer, and that's brought up in her meeting with the dean the next day. Fortunately for Bree and Alice, they're not kicked out of the program they're given a warning and they're being assigned peer mentors, students one year older who have been doing well in the early college program. Enter Nick. Nick is obviously one year older and he is Bree's mentor. She does everything she can to shrug him off for most of the day and then he finds her because he's clever and while they're hanging out together another demon thing shows up. They dispatch with the demon. She actually does a lot to dispatch this demon, even though she doesn't know what she's doing. Turns out it's a hellhound. She gets injured in the process. She gets taken off to people that Nick knows to be healed. They expect that her memory has been wiped. They try to mesmer her. That's what they're calling it. They're trying to wipe her memory. And it doesn't work and she starts to realize that something like this happened to her mother. She starts to realize that actually she's got conflicting memories of what happened that night that she and her father were told that her mother was killed. This police officer was definitely trying to tell her two things at once and have her only hear one of them. And so she, she slowly starts finding out little bits and pieces from Nick about who these people who don't want her to know things are, what the heck is happening with these demons. They are the Legendborn, and they are in a secret society. Something about the uh, Round Table, the Knights of the Round Table. Because yeah, this is our third one. <laughs> and she wants in to this society because she's convinced that this society holds the answers to what happened with her mother. She's very tricky with Nick. She kind of forces her way and she becomes a page in this society. Meanwhile, her father has arranged for her to have a counselor. Her counselor turns out to be one of the few black women on campus and she attended the school at the same time that her mother did. Knew of her mother, wasn't really friends with her mother. Quickly finds out that Brie has a natural talent for a, an elemental magic called the Root and she's surprised that Bree's mother didn't teach her about it, so she starts teaching her about it. And the root is borrowing the natural magic of the earth from your dead ancestors. They have to go to the graveyard and connect with their ancestors to get this magic. So she's got one mentor teaching her about elemental magic called the root and teaching her about how it is so tied to their African-American slave ancestors. And then we've got the Legendborn kinda sorta teaching her about elemental magic called Ether. This is the fifth Aristotle element, earth, air, water, fire, and spirit or Ether. Her magic still seems to be something a little bit different and she's still convinced that the Legendborn have something to do with her mother's death. So that's what she's pursuing here. So Bree's tangled up in the whole, she's in the society as a page to find out more information. She has to play like she wants to become a squire. I don't want to say too much more because I don't want to spoil anything about it. I will say that this book has so much African-American, Southern American black girl experience in it. 
that is so important for everybody reading it to listen to, whether that is you, whether you feel seen by it, whether that is your voice, your experience, or whether it's not. Actually, probably more importantly, if it's not, because we need to understand what kind of racism still goes on today. And that is very clear in this book without becoming the point of this book. Whenever Brie is at the Secret Society house for the Legendborn, people coming in and out who aren't the younger students who are involved as pages and squires and scions, they assume that she is one of the hired help. They even try to pass off tasks to her. When the page class is being introduced, the squire or scion, I'm not entirely sure which, who is starting their tour basically, acknowledges Brie and talks about how this is the most diverse page class that the society has ever had. Which is meant as a snub and received as a snub. Brie is so amazingly witty in defending herself and proving that she is meant to be there, allowed to be there, and that no, she's not the help. So not only is this a very important story in terms of being that own voices type message, it's also just, you know, the best darn YA Arthurian legend fantasy I've ever read. And for, you know, every reason out there, I hope that this book hits the top of every bestseller list there is that it's eligible for. And I'm going to be shouting this one from the rooftops for quite a while. I hope everybody who's interested in any of the categories that book falls into considers ordering it. I am also linking my blog post with the review to that one in the description down below. And in all of the blog posts I'm linking with all of these books I've talked about, I do have Amazon purchase links if I've convinced you to go out and buy them. I've made it easy for you. <laughs> Thanks so much for watching. I actually intended for this to be multiple videos and I filmed them last week when I filmed my fall book tag, but the lighting was so weird and I wore the wrong pants with that t-shirt so I had to crop like up here because it looked weird. So I just refilmed it all as a bigger video talking about what did we talk about? Five books today? Five? Six? I don't even know anymore. <laughs> There were so many great books released in the first half of September. Tell me what other September releases are you excited about? Which ones did you read that I didn't talk about that I need to read? I'd love to hear your suggestions and I will see you next time.